So how do you build a cruise missile with almost no money inside a makeshift factory? Well, you build it like a scavenger. You strip parts from an old trainer jet and move the engine over. It's built to carry one of the biggest warheads possible. But that has a major downside. It becomes very heavy. So heavy, in fact, that you need a booster rocket just to get it off the ground. But how does it compare to an American cruise missile, especially if it doesn't have modern terrain mapping data? This is where it gets interesting. It goes old school using inertial guidance that cannot be jammed by radar. After it reaches the assigned coordinates, it then switches to a Soviet-era inferred tracker, the same guidance system used in the Neptune missile, which can follow a heat source all the way to the target. It's a different old school missiles from a British and French-made Storm Shadow. And will the Russian Panzer anti-air air defense system be able to track and destroy this Ukrainian Flamingo cruise missile more detail all in the video ahead? This is how Ukraine with no defense industry and money build a cruise missile from scraps. So let's start from the front. This is the tip of the spear we have the payout to. Inside it has the guidance and payload. This small probe is critical for air data. It measures the missile's airspeed by sensing the pressure of the air it's flying through. This data is fed constantly to the flight computer. That paydot tube is mounted on the nose cone. This cone is more than just an aerodynamic fairing. It's a radome, meaning it's transparent to radar. This is because it houses the missile's eyes or the advanced guidance package. But they could not afford the terrain following radar like the American cruise missile. So they installed a GPS receiver, along with an inertial navigation system. Just behind the guidance section is the entire point of the mission, the warhead. This was a one-ton Mark 84 bomb, a massive payload designed to destroy hardened targets. This is the business end of the missile. But how does the warhead know when to detonate? That's the job of the fuse. This device tells the warhead to explode at the perfect moment, whether that's on direct impact with a target, after penetrating a certain distance into a bunker, or even as an airburst just above the target. Moving to the center just behind the wings here lies the attitude sensor. This device, part of a larger guidance system, is essential for stable flight. It constantly senses the missile's orientation, its pitch, roll, and yaw, and tells the flight computer so it can make tiny, instant corrections. This cruise missile is heavy and huge when compared to the US Tomahawk. As you can see, it looks tiny. So how does it fly if it's a bigger cruise missile? Well, it is made with carbon fiber. Using this material makes the airframe exceptionally strong while keeping it incredibly light. This lightweight is key to maximizing the missile's range and speed. You'll also notice the hinge access panel, which is simply for ground crews to perform maintenance on the internal systems. But what is a cruise missile? Well, essentially, it's an unmanned jet. To fly, it needs two main things, lift and fuel. For lift, it relies on these two straight wings located right at the center of the missile, locking into the wing attachment socket. The entire central section of the body is dedicated to the fuel tank. This large reservoir holds the jet fuel needed to power the engine for its long journey. But that's not enough to lift the heavy missile. This missile needs to get off the ground and up to speed. They cleverly attach the solid fuel booster. This is a strap-on rocket motor. When the missile is launched, this booster provides a massive, short burst of thrust to accelerate the missile rapidly. Once it's burned out, it detaches and falls away, and the main engine takes over. The main engine needs air to breathe. That air is scooped in through the air intake, which is positioned on top dorsally to reduce the risk of sucking in debris if launched from a low position. This air is funneled directly into the Ivchenko 25 turbofan engine. They literally put a Czech trainer jet and re-engineered into a compact, powerful, and efficient engine that compresses the air, mixes it with fuel from the tank, and ignites it. This controlled explosion is blasted out the back at incredible speed through heat jet exhaust, generating the powerful continuous thrust that propels the missile to its target, sometimes hundreds of miles away. This is phase one, the launch. The mission begins with a violent instantaneous kick. The missile is fired and it's solid fuel booster. This is pure, brutal acceleration. Its only job is to get the missile off the launcher into the air and up to speed in seconds. After just a few seconds, the booster is spent, it detaches, and the missile's entire profile changes. This is the phase two, the cruise phase. The missile is now in the hands of its digital brain. It's using two systems to navigate. First, its GPS receiver. It's constantly talking to satellites, checking its exact position on the globe. But what if the signal is jammed? That's where the INS, or inertial navigation system, takes over. The INS is a dead reckoning system. 
It feels every turn, every climb, every change in speed. By knowing exactly where it started and tracking its own motion, it can calculate its position without any outside help. Together, the GPS and INS guide the Flamingo for thousands of miles, flying low and fast to stay under enemy radar. Its straight wings deploy, catching the air, and its jet engine takes over. The Flamingo is now a small, unmanned jet beginning its long, lonely flight. The crew's navigation has done its job. The missile is now at the target area, but its GPS slash INS brain can only get it to the field. It can't pick out a specific tank. For that, the missile needs its eyes. The nose cone transparent to inferred opens up. The imaging inferred seeker activates. This seeker doesn't see visible light, it sees heat. But the oil tanks, pipes, and processing units are glowing bright white against the black. A digital box appears, scanning, and then locks onto one specific bright tank. And this is what it sees. The cold area is black, but the target, that specific oil tank, worn from its contents, is glowing like a light bulb. But this missile doesn't have a camera like the American Tomahawk, which scans the ground to find a match from an image uploaded before launch. Instead, the Ukrainian Flamingo missile depends on a combination of inertial navigation, infrared, and GPS to hunt its target. This is the terminal phase. The missile is now autonomous, guided only by what its IR seeker sees. The X-form control surfaces are working overtime, making microsecond adjustments, keeping that glowing heat signature perfectly in the center of its vision. It doesn't matter if the target is slightly left or right of its original GPS coordinates. The missile is no longer following a map, it's following its target. In the final millisecond, the fuse detects impact. It instantly detonates the one ton or 1,000 kilogram warhead. From a launch miles away to a long cruise in the dark to a final hunt guided by heat, the Flamingo has found its mark. So how is this different from, say, a Storm Shadow missile? A Storm Shadow has a range of about 155 miles, which is around 250 kilometers. While the challenge is, this is Russia. These oil facilities are located more than a thousand miles away. This gives the Flamingo cruise missile the perfect range as it can travel almost 1,800 miles or right around 3,000 kilometers. But what's the Russian response to a swarm of these cruise missiles? Since these fly very close to the ground, conventional radar struggles to track them. That means one of their only reliable options is a system like the Panzer, a self-propelled, medium-range, surface-to-air missile. They're designed to track and destroy exactly these kinds of low-flying threats. To counter an advanced anti-missile system like that, the Ukrainians might have to send a group of four or five missiles all at once. The strategy is that even if the air defense system stops most of them, if just one gets through, it can cause catastrophic damage to these oil fields, the financial backbone of the Russian economy. But what's inside this free-fall warhead made over 70 years ago? At the front is the nose fuse well, all joined by a fuse conduit. Sandwiched in the middle of this rod is the explosive-filled 500-pound warhead, which translates to around 227 kilograms. This channel rod is connected to a tail fuse. As stated, the bomb can be fitted with a nose fuse, a tail fuse, or both simultaneously. Upon hitting the ground, the frontal fuse activates, burning the fuse conduit from the front to the back, thus creating a huge explosion. The alternative option is using the tail fuse FMU-139. This is usually used for delayed action and is set by the pilot. When it hits the target, the weight of the bomb will penetrate the concrete surface of a building, the fuse activates, and the conduit rod, which creates the 500-pound explosion after a few seconds as programmed. This can create a lot of damage considering its small $4,000 price tag. We make original 4K 3D animation with a small team of animators, so please support us by subscribing and dropping in a comment for more exclusive engineering animations made just for you guys.